Hey guys, thanks for joining us for another episode of Thinking Like a Bank, where we show you how to think like a bank by applying the same principles and strategies that banks use to help you find more financial freedom in your life. I'm your host, Sari Ibrahim. Now, some of our core principles that we apply or we, or we think about are one, investing in real estate, two, saving on taxes, three, having safe and predictable income or wealth, and then four, not having to rely on banks. And we use this typically with a, with a strategy. It's called the bank on yourself strategy that helps us align these, these core principles of thinking like a bank. And with us, we have a special guest today. His name is Mark Willis of Lake Growth Financial Services. He's a certified financial planner, and he's also a bank on yourself professional, somebody who I, I work with closely, one of my good friends, and he's my mentor. He's helped me in this space and helped apply this bank on yourself strategy uh, for us and for our, our clients. And Mark Willis, pretty much, if you were to think of um, martial arts, he is like a black belt at the strategy. And Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. I've never been referred to as a black belt in anything. So, <laughs> um, except maybe eating, that's, that's a favorite pastime <laughs> I have. But yeah, I'm glad to be on the show, Sari. So privileged and honored. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for being on. So pretty much before we jump into all of the, the banking principles and all of the technical stuff of, of bank on yourself, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, um, I, uh, as you know, I'm, I'm the owner of Lake Growth Financial Services uh, and I've got a wonderful family here in Chicago area. We work with clients all over the country as well. Uh, and our goal is to help build and protect people's money and help them achieve their goals in real estate or retirement or college planning or whatever their big milestones in life are without taking a bunch of unnecessary risk. And I know in many ways, there's some commonality there with some of your goals and outcomes as well, Sari. Um, my background is really not one of financial import. We, we started life big time in the red, major student loan debts in the midst of 2008 with no real plan to pay off the debt uh, and no real jobs you know we graduated when they weren't exactly hiring by the by the millions that's for sure in the midst of the great recession so we were really having a hard start in life and it got us really my wife and i really focused on money uh and this is all too common you know i think 2020 was another wake-up call for another generation and i would suppose i don't know what your listeners might be experiencing in the economy when they're listening to this in the future but my bet is that volatility didn't stop, you know, that we're still having, whenever you're listening to this, we're still going through major market gyrations, uh, uncertainties about markets, taxes, and more, whether it's the coronavirus or whether it's something else, you know, there's always another black swan uh, in our portfolios. So that's sort of where we got our start. Uh, it feels like we're playing the same card over and over again. Um, whether it's 2008 or 2020 or 2025 or whatever. So that's kind of where my journey began. Oh, nice. Thank you for sharing that. You, you mentioned a good thing about, um, or an important piece about unnecessary risks. You know, we all take risks, right? Especially entrepreneurs and investors, but it's about not taking unnecessary risks. We're no, taking okay. calculated risks. Now, as far as what we do for work, like the bank on yourself strategy, would you mind summarizing what is the bank on yourself concept or the, the bank on yourself strategy? You're right. I think the best, the coolest thing, your podcast name is so spot on to think like a bank um, because we are too often thinking like borrowers, aren't we? Um, we pay out the nose in interest. You know, the average American, according to the US Commerce Bureau, pays 36% of his or her income on financing debts. And that means if time is money, that a third of your day is spent working as a slave to the bank. And if you added taxes on top of that, that's half of your day gone, even if you're an entrepreneur. And I agree with you about taking calculated necessary risk. That's a good thing. I love the growth potential of my business, of real estate investing and more. That's a good thing, taking those necessary risks to help meet our goals. But if I am unnecessarily shoveling money into the pockets, literally into the pockets of mega banks, credit cards, auto loans, student loans, mortgages, uh, you know, the average 30 year mortgage doubles in cost the value of your property that you bought over the duration or amortization of that mortgage. So if you bought a $300,000 house, 30 year mortgage, 
you'll end up giving the bank 600 grand, half of that being interest. So that's a, over your 30 year period there on a low interest. But here's really where things get interesting. The banks don't care or they really don't make as much money off the interest rate. They make their money on the volume. Uh, and it's just like eating. Back to black belt eater here. Um, you know, it's not, the, it's not the rate by which I eat my dinner that, that counts to my waistline. It's not the f speed of eating that gets to my waistline and my love handles. It's, it's, the, it's the volume that'll get me. You know, it's the volume of food that you eat. And the same is true with all of our interest. We might have 3% on our mortgage, you know, 0% interest credit cards for a year or two, auto loans at 3 or 4%. But the volume of your monthly payments, four grand a month, let's say, or 40 grand a month, let's say, going out the door just in interest, and all of a sudden you realize that you are covering the nut of somebody else's retirement, not your own. So to think like a banker is really the key. And to begin to really realize that if you could recapture some of that interest and become your own source of financing, not just to pay cash, because that's the problem. Most people think, oh, my banking is the problem, so I'm going to stop in being in the banking world. And that is unfortunately not the answer, because if you just paid cash, well, you're just simply saving, saving, saving for the car, and then losing all that growth every time you make the purchase. So to me, every time you've built up enough savings and then you spend it, you you've lost the compound growth opportunity on that cash, right, Sari? Mm -hmm. You've lost that growth. So it's almost like getting punched in, you know, back to karate or, or black belts. <laughs> it's like being punched by your opponent. Every time you've, you think you're making some progress, you just get socked in the gut and you get, you just drop to your knees. So breaking compound growth is the worst thing you could do in your financial life. Charlie Munger, you know, the partner with uh, Warren Buffett, he says, never, never break compound growth unnecessarily. So every time you pay cash, you're still operating in that system where you're tied down to net zero. So the, the, the title of this podcast show is Think Like a Bank. I love it. I think that's really where you can go from a headwind to a tailwind. If you get, uh, if you, if you get a, a, a mindset like the bankers have, where it's not just like, let's use somebody else's money. Let's use our own vault. Let's use our cash to become our own source of financing. Not literally setting up an FDIC insured bank. Thank goodness. That'd be tens of millions of bucks and <laughs> a decade to wait for a bank charter. But instead, using tools that are readily available to the average American, where you can become your own source of financing like a bank and bring the banking function back home. So there are tools that you can do and employ, but it starts with the mindset first. You got to think like a bank uh, and then come on down the ladder to the real tools, tap, tactics, strat strategies that Sari's going to teach you guys to be able to employ this tool and this strategy and most importantly, this mindset in your financial life. It changes everything, right, Sari? It's like, mm -hmm. it's, it, it literally changes your picture of everything that you do in your financial life. Correct. Well, thank you for sharing that. Now, you know, we, the, some people might see the strategy we use and, you know, that was all beautifully well said about the interest. I think that's the most important piece of this is re, having the ability to recoup that interest you would otherwise pay. And we kind of use a counterintuitive approach, right, of using dividend paying whole life insurance. That is mm -hmm. pretty much what the bank on yourself strategy is. It's that we're, we're building up cash value whole life insurance. To, but of course, not just any whole life insurance. It has to be properly structured from the right company and, and the right funding amounts, which is what a bank on yourself professional does. We're credentialed and licensed to properly structure these policies. So, you know, what is your take on um, the, the point of it being whole life insurance? Like why, why, why is it a whole life insurance policy? Well, you're right. Sorry, it's a, of all things, why in the world would we be talking about life insurance in a podcast designed to help us think like a bank? Well, let's set aside the, the mindset part of the conversation because that's a whole, that, that, that could take years to really have that mindset shift from consumer to banker. That's, that's truly a mindset shift that can take a long time to take, uh, to, to go through. 
you know, uh, Neo, he took a red pill and he immediately woke up in the matrix, but it still took him some time to really come around to where he was, what the story was, who the characters were and who the evil villains were. And, you know, so the red pill was one thing, maybe that's the tool that woke him up. And, but it's, it's the, it's the learning, the process uh, of being a banker that really takes some time for a lot of folks. So yes, you're right. Whole life insurance of all things in the financial universe has the capacity to help us act like a banker. Once you're thinking, you can start to act like a banker. You know, I would rather Tiger Woods golf swing than have a bag of his own clubs. And so the swing is learning to think like a banker. The, the clubs are the whole life insurance. Now, whole life insurance is this weird old fashioned uh, asset in the financial universe that does a couple of things really well and helps us act like a banker. One, it's a big bucket of liquid cash. Now a bank needs big buckets of liquid cash. Why? Well, so they can lend it out. You know, uh, they need to give it out to their customers. What do they do when the customer borrows that money? When I, when Siri, let's say you walk into a real bank down the street mm -hmm. and you hand them $10,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're depositing 10,000 bucks and your, your name, Sarah Ibrahim is right there on that mm -hmm. $10,000 deposit. Now I'm right behind you in line and I request a loan for 10,000 bucks. Where are they getting that cash? From uh, my money, the deposit. Yeah. Come with your money. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So guys look up fractional reserve banking. Just Google that and just figure out how much your bank credit unions are worse than mega banks, but not by a lot. And not right now in this season, right now, banks are not even required to keep even a few percentage points of your deposit on reserve. They're able to loan it all out and get, they're going to charge the borrower 10% and pay poor Siri, the depositor, less than 1%. So why participate in that process when you could use a whole life policy which just like a, a bank allows you to borrow against the cash and to get arbitrage. That's the, that's the mindset shift. Learning to think like a banker means to do something better than just paying cash. So we just said that when you pay cash for something, you're, you're stopping the compound growth. Well, with these whole life policies, if it's designed the bank on yourself way, and Sarah, you brought up a great point about that, which we can come back to. It has to be designed by a bank on yourself professional. It has to be designed the bank on yourself way. It's a very specific uh, set of qualifications to become a bank on yourself type whole life policy. If we have that correct, if we've designed it correctly from the start, then when you borrow against your life insurance cash value, it will continue to grow as if you had not touched the money. So back to our example, if you've got $10,000 in your cash value and you walk in as the borrower to your own bank and you borrow against that 10,000, that year and every year, the policy will continue to pay you guaranteed cash increases plus dividends on the entire 10,000 bucks as if you hadn't touched the money. Now that to me changes everything in your financial life. So I better hush there, Sari, what would you add to that? Cause that's, I just said a lot. Yeah, thank you so much, Mark, for sharing that. The piece about arbitrage. Now, in your in your opinion, or you know, what what exactly is an arbitrage? Well, it's a fancy two dollar cocktail term. That's what it is uh, that you can throw around at your next cocktail party. No, it's uh, it's it's just a <laughs> it's it's the spread. It's the difference between what something cost you and what you got out of it. You know, the arbitrage of my college degree. You know, I had a cost of tuition versus how much more money might I have made with the college degree versus having not gotten the college degree. It's, you know, it's the cost versus the growth. It's that spread mm -hmm. that we'll call arbitrage. Okay, nice. And, and this is something that whole life, the, the bank on yourself type whole life policies can offer is the spread yep. between the money that you're earning in the policy and when you're using it. So Maybe for example- better exa Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, go ahead. Uh, maybe even another example is just, you know, if you bought a house and you've got a cost of interest on your, on that house, but then you could get more in terms of cash flow on that house. Let's say your mortgage was 2000 bucks a month, but you were renting it for 3000 bucks a month. There's an, there's a positive net spread to you in that regard as well. Awesome. Okay. That makes a lot of Sorry sense. Sorry to interrupt you there. Oh, no, no worries. No problem. Okay. 
So what else should people know? Like what else, uh, what are some other, I think, dangers or things that people should consider? Like, for example, if somebody says, you know, I have my money in a mutual fund, it's in the stock market, I have a 401k um, and some term life insurance, I have nothing to worry about. What are some other dangers that people need to consider? Well, if you believe you have nothing to worry about, uh, I don't want to wake you up from that dream. So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I don't mean to ruin anyone's perfectly good dream, but uh, the truth is there may be some significant things to worry about. Uh, and I won't say that whole life insurance is without, you know, consideration. So let's first talk about buy term, term insurance and then put money in the 401k. One, when you have term insurance, you're renting it. Uh, which means that r landlord can raise the rent on you and there's no equity building up in your term insurance. It's just renting, mm -hmm. just renting. And they can kick you out if you get too old um, or don't, don't get approved for the medical exams later on in life. 99% of term insurance, sorry, never mm -hmm. pays a claim. It's like free money to the insurance company. Uh, so that's the term insurance. Now on the 401k, uh, you know, I, I would say, what do you believe about the market right now? Is it at the low point or is it at the high point? Now, again, I don't know the answer to this because I don't know when you're listening to it, but as we're recording this, the market was hitting record highs. So if you're putting regular monthly contributions into that 401k, aren't you buying at the record high every single month? Doesn't that seem like a less than intelligent thing to do? Um, just looking at it from a rational perspective. And then if you think that taxes might go up in the future, like most people and most economists believe that taxes will go up mm -hmm. over our lifetime, uh, then why would we defer that ticking tax time bomb into an unknown future? You know, if, and, and then you've got to remember, it's not just at retirement that you pay your taxes on your 401k, it's every year mm -hmm. in your retirement. So that might be 30, 40, 50 years more of your life, depending on how old you are when you're listening to this. Now, if you gave Congress 50 years to make up their mind, on something, they're probably going to do it, which is raise taxes, you know, <laughs> eventually. Okay. So do you want to risk the, the market? Do you want to risk Congress changing the rules on you every single year of your human life? I would prefer personally to get a preset guaranteed minimum increase of my cash value plus dividends on top of that. Mm -hmm. It's a boring middle single digit return. Mm -hmm. which I like. It's a tax-free. If we design it correctly, it could even be done with taxes, no taxes due, both on principal and on gains. If we design the uh, policies correctly, the tax law says policies could be accessed completely tax-free with no investment fees. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's insurance costs, you know, that's for sure, but there's no investment asset center management fees. There's no taxes due on the policy. It's liquid, so we can still use it for our real estate deals. Mm -hmm. And 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 then, of course, it's life insurance at the end of the day. So And it's, it's not going to get canceled on us like term insurance would. To me, that seems like a much better, more sane uh, way to meet our financial goals without taking unnecessary risk. Wow. That's awesome. That's it's so much that people, you know, you know, when I first got into this uh, industry, I thought of, you know, when people invest, for example, there's just one side to it. It's what's the rate of return on it? How much, if I put in X amount of dollars, how much am I going to get back? And that could be the case. That's, a, that's still an important metric, but there's so many other things that you mentioned that you need to look at the tax implications, the liquidity yeah. aspect, the volatility aspect. There's more to it, which I love about, you know, thinking like a bank is it's looking at different angles of your money and still, Another th really cool thing too is the liquidity aspect is that we're not, it's not either or, it's not either whole life insurance or real estate. We're, we're funding a whole life policy, increasing the cash value, borrowing from that, and then using that to invest in real estate or invest in our businesses or wherever else we want. So I, I love it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're, we're taking control of our financial future where the policy's contract value is predetermined before we even begin. I mean, mm -hmm. think about how many things in your life financially have an, or anything really, where is where the outcome is determined before you even start. Mm -hmm. Think about marriage. Think about your children. Think about every real estate deal you buy. How many real estate deals do you buy that house down the street or that apartment building 
and all of a sudden you walk in and you see that giant crack in the foundation that you didn't notice, that's, that's not an outcome that was determined before you bought the house, was mm -hmm. it? Right. Uh, sometimes surprises happen. Well, you know, it's not, it's, it's not a, there's no, no perfect reality. Even whole life insurance has considerations. We need to look at it. Again, still start with the concept of thinking like a bank. Because when you have that as your foundation, you can come into each financial decision with that mindset and everything else becomes easier. When you're functioning and working like a bank, when you've reclaimed the, the banking function in your life, um, Sari, as you know, personally, firsthand, having mm -hmm. uh, several of these policies and now thinking like a bank, mm -hmm. uh, you, you understand that when you control the financial environment where your money lives, you win, mm -hmm. you know? Doesn't matter what your mutual funds did last year or what the real estate might have done last summer, you know, or if rent moratoriums continue or whatever else is going on in the world as you're listening to this. Mm -hmm. If you have a, a financial vehicle that gets more and more efficient every year you have it, then everything else becomes either easier or unnecessary in your financial life. It's pretty remarkable. Right, exactly. Yeah, th thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, now, aside from you know, the bank on yourself or, or with the, within the bank on yourself concept, what are some, some books that you recommend listeners to check out? Well, um, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll mention one. There was a, a book by Pamela Yellen called the bank on yourself revolution. So if you read nothing else, just check that book out. Um, I hear Sari Ibrahim has an ebook that he's working on. <laughs> Uh, that I'm anxiously ready to read and excited to read. So make sure that that one gets mentioned. Guys, subscribe to this show so you can know all the details about the things Sari's making and producing. This is a man you want to be following for sure. Um, you know, you might also check out uh, other books out there like Becoming Your Own Banker by Nelson Nash. And there's a good book. If you, if you would like to get more of a textbook style on this, uh, check out Financial Independence in the 21st Century by Wayne Burnell. Um, and those are three really good ones to get started. And again, there's lots of resources out there, but you have to know where to look for sure. Mm -hmm. And then do you recommend that people do their research before reaching out to an advisor for, for them to actually understand this concept better before like implementing this within their lives? Um, well, let me give everyone some context because, again, I didn't stumble into this mm -hmm. just loving life insurance. That wasn't, <laughs> you know, at all the, <laughs> the path. Um, what I found was I was looking for a way to meet my own goals, to pay off some student loans, to, to pay, buy a house, to invest in real estate, to, you know, all the things that one might want to do in life. And when I found this concept, I realized that there were, I did a little research and found 400,000 life insurance agents currently in the United States. That's one life insurance agent for every 800 Americans, Siri. Oh. Um, now, there are about 200 bank on yourself professionals, 200. Mm -hmm. So what that means is you are more rare, Siri, than a heart surgeon. Um, <laughs> and okay, and you specifically have some training and some expertise and some awareness that your, your typical stock jockey or accountant or insurance agent does not know. And so for the average person listening, I would highly recommend you talk directly with Sari because he can give you the research that can help you go down the right rabbit holes. Because there are a ton of rabbit holes on the internet, as we all know. You can mm -hmm. basically come to any conclusion you want to doing your research online. Um, any, any side of the argument, you can come down to your own conclusions. So, you know, don't use Dr. Google to diagnose your, your lump on, on your neck and don't use Dr. Google as your financial planner either. Talk to Sari or someone who's got a bank on yourself professional credential behind their name and has been qualified and certified to build and design these type of policies from the ground up. It takes the right insurance company. You got to make sure it's got the right contract. You want to make sure it's got um, paid up additions. And mm -hmm. we could go down that, that list at some point in the future, uh, Sari, but you already know, you know, it's like if I want an iPhone, mm -hmm. I don't try to design my own iPhone. I go to the people who know how to build iPhones mm -hmm. or, or Android or whatever your cup of tea is, but I go to the people who understand it and have engineered it from the start. And then all I have to do is swipe up and it works. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. So wow. I would say, yes, do your research, but talk to Siri because he can help guide you in the right direction. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for mentioning all of this. Now we're pretty much wrapping up. Um, and do you have any final words, Mark, to, for the listeners, something for them to kind of remember from this? Well, um, I would say that the fish are the last to notice that they're in the water. <laughs> and that's, that's a silly statement, but it's true. We are already in the banking business. Mm -hmm. we're, we're just sitting on the wrong side of the banker's desk. And if you're trying to get into real estate, if this is, you know, first time or two you've done a deal, you might see the bank as the gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you, uh, it is more so that way, the more you do real estate, the more you realize that they hold all the purse strings and they're the first to collect the check if things go south in mm -hmm. your deals. Uh, and a banker is a fellow who will lend you his umbrella when the sun is shining, but wants it back as soon as it starts to rain. So I would just say, guys, um, notice as the fish, notice that you are in the water. You are in the banker's world. It's the banker's world. We're all just living in it, mm -hmm. like they say. So if you can become your own source of financing, it's like, back to Black Belt, it's like financial jujitsu. Mm -hmm. You can take the problem of banking coming at you, use the, the power of the and the weight of the enemy mm -hmm. and take it to your advantage. So if you want to use that for Black Belt, that's fine, I guess. But that's my final piece of advice. Guys, think like a bank and everything else becomes easier. Wow, thank you so much, Mark. Thank you for being on our show. If you'd guys like to reach out to us, you can go to our website. It's finassetprotection.com, F-I-N, assetprotection.com to schedule a free consultation. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining us today. My pleasure. Sorry, keep up the great work. Thank you. To learn more about what we do and how we can help you grow more wealth, please visit www.finassetprotection.com. That's F-I-N, assetprotection.com. The topics presented in this podcast are for general information only and not for the purposes of providing legal, accounting, or investment advice. On such matters, please consult a professional who knows your specific situation.